Thank you very much for inviting me tonight. I have to say that there's a lot of dedicated people in this room, and I'm uh, really delighted to be among you. The goal uh, of the work in which I am engaged is to build a better bridge between science and public understanding. And because I live in your base basin, although I have to say that it's the western limit, I'm profoundly interested in what's happening to Lake Winnipeg. And Though the attention of our initiative was drawn to Lake Winnipeg because of the extent of eutrophication, I must admit that I worry about what is happening here because I fear that the changes that are occurring in this basin symbolize early evidence of significant changes in broader hydroclimatic regimes that could have devastating impacts on our economy and way of life, not just in Manitoba or Canada, but throughout the entire central interior region of the continent. So the purpose of my presentation tonight is to bring forward the latest science that, in my estimation, at least points to both the growing number of challenges we face in re reversing the deteriorating state of Lake Winnipeg and to the larger hydroclimatic changes that are make, making Lake Winnipeg a symbol of much more far-reaching problems to which we must pay attention if we want to sustain prosperity in Manitoba and throughout this region. So all speculation aside, What's really happening out there? Well, <clears throat> you don't need to be a scientist to figure out there are weathers all over the place. Rainstorms, ice storms, and snowstorms are paralyzing our transportation and electricity distribution systems. They de-iced airplanes in Winnipeg this morning. Both high and low temperatures are being broken everywhere. Cold snaps are persisting for weeks. Snow is falling in places and in volume seldom witnessed before. Flooding is occurring widely. But even with all this evidence, right before our very eyes, we still find ourselves tiptoeing around the climate issue. So what can we say scientifically that we actually know? Well, the first thing we know is that something really that we've known for thousands of years, and that is that human activities can result in climate change even in the absence of greenhouse gas emissions. And civilizations that existed long before fossil fuels came into existence knew the consequences of sweeping land use changes. And we know now that landscape change can have twice the impact as climate warming on a regional basis, uh, even uh, 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 in addition to average increases in global uh, gases. So what you can say is that uh, you can have these climate effects even without adding uh, and, and changing the composition of the atmosphere. And it's estimated that we have altered one half to a, a third of our planet's land surface. So what we're learning in our time is that on top of these effects, you add uh, more of a certain more of certain substances that already compose it to the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide and methane. Then both landscape and climate change can occur uh, simultaneously and accelerate, and they began to feed one another and bolster the other. And the thing I want to point out in terms of the most recent science uh, is that this is the 349th consecutive month of above-average temperatures globally. So if you are younger than 29, you live in a different climate regime than the rest of us. The second thing we know is that warmer temperatures are causing changes in the rate and manner in which water moves through the global hydrologic cycle. Glaciers are disappearing. Uh, patterns of snowfall and duration of snow cover are changing. A lot of water left on the landscape is ice and snow or is cold water in deep lakes left here after the last ice age is moving to a different place in the hydrosphere. The atmosphere is gaining moisture, which provides more fuel to energize storms. This also makes wet places wetter, while increasing evaporation, which makes dry places drier. And the third thing that we know is that the loss of polar sea ice appears to be causing the jet stream to meander, uh, causing destabilization of historic weather patterns, which in combination with a poleward advance of tropical storm tracks and the atmosphere's capacity to carry more water vapor appears to be resulting in more extreme weather events. So what can science tell us about all this that we're not getting from the news, from television, or from Hollywood movies? So allow me to introduce some of these teleconnected hydroclimatic effects that uh, researchers have identified as threats to the stability of our weather system. So water, as many of you know, is, is the more you know about water, the more otherworldly this substance appears to be. And once it, it's frozen, it takes an enormous amount of heat to weaken the hydrogen bonds that hold water molecules in the fixed crystalline structure of ice. And uh, one of the most significant 
recent advancements in hydrometeorology is the realization of the global importance of the refrigerating influence of Arctic sea ice. Polar sea ice is now seen as a thermometer that governs major weather patterns globally. And it's now feared that the decrease in the extent and thickness of sea ice could be the parameter that's feeding all of the increases that are causing concern over climate change. There's been a 75% decrease in the volume of Arctic sea ice in the last 35 years. And this loss of sea ice allows heat to warm the Arctic Ocean, creating a feedback which melts more ice. And this is why the Arctic is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world. The loss of sea ice and the reduction in the extent and duration of snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere are reducing the temperature gradient between the pole and the tropics. And it's this difference in temperature between the polar region and the warmer air to the south that largely defines the behavior of the jet stream. And if you can bring this up for me, Julian. Uh, observations of the jet stream have revealed that warmer atmospheric temperatures do not automatically translate into warmer weather. Uh, as we've seen this past winter, in a uniformly and therefore more turbulent atmosphere, both warm and cold fronts end up and persist in places in the middle latitudes in which they were not common in the past. And I, I'm sure that all of you really enjoyed experiencing that here in Winnipeg this past winter. So what appears to be happening is really interesting, however. What we've observed is that as the sea ice melts, the Arctic warms, reducing the temperature gradient between the pole and the tropics. And as the Arctic air warms, it expands to take up more space in the atmosphere and begins to spill down the hill that is the world toward the mid-latitudes. And the thicker air turns to the right as the Earth spins and creates the jet stream. And the influence of warmer Arctic air causes the west winds created by the jet stream to become weaker. And weaker westerly winds are wavier. Try that as a tongue twister. <laughs> so it's the waviness of the jet stream that creates weather at mid-latitudes. And as the jet stream slows and the waves become wider, weather patterns persist longer and do things that we don't expect them to do. So when we look at extreme weather events such as heat waves and heavy snowfall events, what we're seeing is a very large uh, or slowing and wavier jet stream and uh, what this does is, you can go to the next slide, uh, is it has some unexpected uh, effects. And one of the effects is to disrupt uh, the polar vortex. And I, I guess I didn't tell, need to tell anybody in Winnipeg that the polar vortex appears to have been disrupted this winter. And uh, much has been made of that. There are actually two elliptical or circular polar vortices, one usually over the Arctic and one over the Antarctic in their respective winters. And the latter is very stable. In the Arctic, however, the vortex is more variable. It's influenced from below by the changing Arctic sea ice cover and from above by stratospheric warming. And this winter, both factors have served to weaken the vortex, and a weak vortex is much more susceptible to disturbance at the periphery by the polar jet stream. So instead of one consolidated vortex over the Arctic, there developed four lobes with cold circulations carried south in troughs of the jet stream. And one of the lobes descended and lingered over eastern and central North America, immersing Winnipeg in what I consider to be the cold of near space. And uh, another created rain-induced floods in the UK, and at the same time, interestingly, Greenland, the Canadian Arctic, Alaska, and the Yukon were uh, particularly mild. What we're also seeing is atmospheric circulation patterns are changing and pushing major subtropical storm tracks toward the poles, often causing floods of magnitudes uh, we're poorly equipped to manage. And this is what we're seeing more and more widely, droughts and wildfires followed by major floods in the same basins in the same year, come hell and high water, as I call it. So what we see is the flooding that we saw in Manitoba and Saskatchewan in 2011, uh, in Calgary, Toronto, and Colorado in 2013 uh, are really uh, all linked to hydroclimatic circumstances associated with combined effects of a warmer, more turbulent atmosphere. 
So as I mentioned in every presentation I make, the algorithm upon which this assertion rests is one of the most basic principles in all of atmospheric physics. Warmer air holds more water. And what this means is that some of the old math and many of the old methods of managing water will no longer work. And uh, this is what the issue is in Alberta uh, this past year and also here in 2011. So is this something we should be worried about? Well, I think so. Uh, the reason why I think so is that we're also learning a great deal more about other atmospheric phenomena, uh, such as atmospheric rivers. And I've talked much before about atmospheric rivers. They've likely been around for an eternity, but only now because of satellite remote sensing capacity do we know of their existence. And these corridors of intense winds and moist air can be four to 500 kilometers across and thousands of kilometers long and they can carry the equivalent of 10 times the average daily discharge of the St. Lawrence. And what's interesting in terms of the new science that we're seeing is we're confronted recently by the realization that these amazing rivers of water vapor aloft, uh, like the jet stream, also derive their energy from the temperature gradient between the poles and the tropics, and their intensity also derives from the clausius clapeyron relation, in that warmer the air is, the more water vapor atmospheric rivers can carry. We're also concerned uh, that the kinds of storms we'll have in the future may be fundamentally different in character than what we've experienced. At a recent international conference in Canmore, it was demonstrated that the floods in Manitoba and Alberta were very similar in some ways. Each involved rotating low pressure systems that remained in the same place for an unusual period of time, bringing continuous precipitation up from the south, which resulted in long duration, heavy rainfall events that covered very large areas. And while exhibiting all of these characteristics, the Colorado flood uh, in 2013 was different that in that it occurred in September so researchers are also examining some of the other anomalies. The behavior of the storm suggests that its precipitation may be generated by processes of raindrop formation more typical of, uh, uh, of tropical regions in which the storm originated than in local temperate conditions where most of the rainfall starts as snow and then melts as it falls uh, toward the ground. And the state climatologist of Colorado, Nolan Deskin, noted that the storm shattered all records for the most water vapor in the atmosphere. And from this, we might survive, surmise that the floods of 2013 and 2011 offer us a glimpse into the weather that uh, we might expect in a warmer world. And unfortunately, <clears throat> the flooding that we've experienced um, is really nothing compared to what the atmosphere is capable of delivering in the future. And this was made evident by a series of extreme weather events that happened uh, principally in Russia after our event. And what happened in Russia is almost beyond imagination. It was almost the stuff of science fiction. And the, what happened there is the weakening of the European jet stream caused by reduced snow and ice cover led uh, to the creation of a heat dome, a huge high in Siberia. In July, hundreds of wildfires broke out that were so hot they melted the permafrost below uh, the burning forest to create methane releases uh, from the thawing tundra that added fuel to the fires. And then what happened after that in August was simply amazing. In the midst of what was coming to resemble a virtual firestorm, three atmospheric rivers collided over the region and within four days created a flood that covered a million square kilometers, which I should point out is roughly the size of your basin. So I'd like to conclude by uh, Summarizing what we might learn from what we know about changing hydroclimatic circumstances elsewhere, what we're seeing is that the hydrological game is clearly changing, and we're beginning to glimpse the main, how these main rules are going to change. Uh, Dr. John Pomeroy and his colleagues at the University of uh, Saskatchewan have already observed an increase in rainfall on the Canadian prairies and consistent with the effect a reduced temperature gradient between the pole and the tropics would have on the jet stream, more of that rainfall is being produced by multi-day rainfall events uh, generated by frontal storms coming from the Gulf of Mexico as opposed to, to local thunderstorms. And we can expect more precipitation generally in many places and that precipitation may come in fewer and more powerful storms. New research findings released last week at the Canadian Geophysical Union Conference in Banff confirm and add to these findings. At that conference, 
University of Saskatchewan researcher Stacy Demansky reported that there has been a 50% increase in the duration of precipitation events in parts of the Canadian prairie since the 1940s. And this has resulted in a 30% increase in precipitation in some regions of the prairies since the 1990s. Demansky's key finding, however, was that the increase in the intensity and duration of precipitation events has resulted in a four-fold increase in stream flow during those events. And she concluded that this four-fold increase in stream flow and runoff ratio after 1994 may be due to nonlinear or step-like threshold responses to a combination of climate change, recent dramatic increases in wetland drainage, and land use. So, as predicted by the climate models, and this is important, we now may be experiencing nonlinear step like changes in the manner in which water moves through the hydrologic cycle on the Great Plains. And what this means is that it's not just mobilization of nutrients and contaminants that cause eutrophication in Lake Winnipeg and other water courses that we have to worry about. An entire new runoff regime is coming into existence that could further exacerbate eutrophication while at the same time dramatically increasing flood damage and also simultaneously the risk of drought. And as John Pomeroy has pointed out, we may have altered the hydrology here as much as any other place on earth and changes will likely accelerate as temperatures rise, mobilizing more nutrients and floods and this suggests some urgency in action. And I should say this is not the time, and I say this all the time, this is not the time to throw up our hands in helpless desperation. We're not helpless. We know what to do. There's still room to move, but we have to get moving while that room still exists. Thank you.